Hi everyone, I'm Christine from Bay Area Restoration Council. Bay Area Restoration Council represents the public interest in the restoration of Hamilton Harbor and the rest of its watershed. So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land where all the water is draining into one location. So our watershed is all the land where the water eventually drains into Hoots Paradise Marsh and Hamilton Harbor. Our watershed is also made up of different communities. This includes Burlington, Hamilton, and Castor, Dundas, even Stony Creek. What's your favorite nature spot in our watershed? We are lucky enough that our watershed is filled with biodiversity. Bio meaning life, diversity meaning variety. We have lots of different things that live here. What plants and animals have you seen in our watershed? One of the reasons that we have so much diversity here, about a quarter of Canada's plants, over 50 different species of endangered or threatened animals, is because we have a marsh. So a marsh is a type of wetland. It's characterized by standing water, as well as having lots of emergent vegetation like different sedges and cattails. So one animal that you can find living in Coots Paradise Marsh or other streams and ponds in our watershed are frogs. And we have a huge diversity of frogs, all sorts of different types, which we're going to learn about today. Frogs are really well adapted to living in the marsh. You might notice on a frog, they have these big, strong back legs. So if I want to be a frog, I have to have very strong legs. So I'm going to do some squats to make sure I have strong legs. Now, a frog can jump many times its body length. So a gray tree frog can jump 14 times its body length. So we are going to do 14 squats. Can you do 14 squats or jumps to get strong legs like a frog? So at the end of those super strong legs, they do have feet with toes, just like us, but they are very long toes and webs so that they can catch the water and swim faster. So if I want to have webbed long toes to help me swim better, I'm going to need some flippers. And strong legs and toes that are webbed aren't the only adaption a frog has. They also have these big eyes that stick out of their head to give them a wider range of vision. And they have a clear eyelid called a nicotating membrane that kind of acts like goggles. So again, becoming a frog, I can't really make my eyes stick out of my head, but I can put on some goggles. So we looked at their eyes, but frogs also have well adapted ears. Can you guys point to your ears? So their ears are more flat, they don't stick out like mine, and they are called chimaphone. And that's what they use for hearing. It's very streamlined so that the water can flow right over them. You'll also notice they don't really have much of a neck, and again, that's just to make it more streamlined. They can swim faster. So we're gonna get rid of our neck, punch your shoulders, and I'm going to use this bandana to tie my ears down flat so that they aren't sticking out 
They're flat like a frog's. So one more adaption that a frog has that's really special is their skin. So their skin is permeable. It can absorb things through the skin, like water. That's how frogs mainly drink. And it also comes in all sorts of colors, from green to brown to even sometimes this bluish tinge. And those colors help it to camouflage. So I need to change my colors because I am bright blue right now and I would not camouflage with a forest or a marsh. I put on my cape so that I can camouflage into the surroundings, just like a frog, which is why even though we have so many frogs here, you might not have seen them. You have to go out and look for them or listen for them. So I have tried to become the best human frog possible, trying to get some of those adaptions that a frog has had, but I still don't quite look like a real frog. So let's learn about those real frogs that you can actually see in our watershed. One of the first frogs that you will hear in the spring is the spring peeper, Pseudocris crucifer. So the spring peeper is one of our smaller frogs, about two to three centimeters and they're not very heavy they don't weigh much more than a paper clip so these guys if you do happen to see them are typically a kind of more tan or brown color and they have a dark kind of band between their eyes kind of like a line from eye to eye and they have this x dark darker sometimes it's a little bit lighter across their back. Um, so that X is really a characteristic of the spring peeper. They are very, very loud. So what they don't make up for in size, they make up for in sound. You can hear them over a kilometer away. And they are named after their call, the spring peeper. So they peep in spring, March, April, May. And sometimes you can hear them in the fall again, too. Um, so here is that call. It's just that even peeping, um, almost like a, a beep on a timer. Can you guys peep like a spring peeper? Can you just go peep, peep? Can. And we do have one other type of chorus frog within our watershed, the western chorus frog. It's very small like the spring peeper, a little bit bigger, typically being more about three centimeters. And it's a light brown kind of tan color, but it has three kind of darker stripes down the back. Sometimes those stripes are broken up though, so it's like long skinny spots. Um, and they have a white line along the side of their body all the way from the tip of their snout to the other end. They are like the spring peeper, an early breeder, so you hear them right um, in March and April. Their call, though, while noisy like the peeper, is very distinct. It sounds like if you were to run your thumb over a comb. So if you have your own comb, I do recommend trying trying out that that call because it's pretty fun to do. That is the Western chorus frog. Another common frog that we have throughout the watershed is the wood frog, Lithobates sylvatica. Um, so the wood frog is a smallish to medium sized frog, anywhere from about three to eight centimeters. They're typically more brown, tan, or copper, the color of wood. They do have a triangular kind of black mask right underneath both of their eyes. Um, and then they do have a lighter upper lip 
as if they were drinking milk and it got all over their face. They don't actually drink milk, of course. We do hear them fairly early in the spring, around the time of the spring peeper, so kind of starting in March. They can survive the cold quite well. In fact, they're one of the only frogs that is found north of the Arctic Circle. And that's just because they can almost freeze completely solid and then still survive. Um, they typically like to hang out where there's more ponds with lots of emergent vegetation, such as willows and sedges or even cattails. And their call is actually kind of like a rolling duck or quacking like a duck. So it sounds like this. <laughs> And that's the wood frog. What frog species is this? Is it a spring peeper, a western chorus frog, or a wood frog? That was the wood frog. Whose call is this? Was it the spring peeper, the western chorus frog, or the wood frog? That was the Western Chorus Frog. A frog that is named after its looks is the leopard frog, Lithobates pipiens. It's a medium-sized frog, about five to nine centimeters, that is typically green or even like a light kind of brown color with dark brown or black spots. So that's why it's called the leopard frog, those spots. And those spots are very random. They're not in any sort of pattern. They also do have a white upper lip, like they drank some milk and it got stuck on them. And leopard frogs are pretty common throughout the watershed. Um, and leopard frogs are one of the frogs that we do study as an indicator species under the remedial action plan. So what that means is we monitor them to make sure that they're doing okay to kind of tell us how well the entire marsh is doing. Because all frogs, like leopard frogs, are sensitive to different chemicals and other pollutants. And they sound almost like a chuckle or a laugh, followed by a sound of like when you rub a balloon. Um, so this is what it sounds like. That's a leopard frog. Now, the leopard frog might be confusing when you learn about the pickerel frog um, just because they do look so similar. So the pickerel frog, Lithobates palustris, um, isn't very common in our watershed, so it's actually pretty unlikely you'll see it, um, but it is still found here. So it is more of a cream colored or brown, so less green, and it still has brown and kind of black spots, but those spots are more squarish and they're running down their back kind of in rows. So it's not that random pattern that the leopard frog has. Their thighs also have like a inner thigh, a bright yellowy kind of color. And they do have quite a different call though. Their call is more like someone snoring and you'll hear these guys typically in May. This is what their call is, that snoring sound. It also reminds me a little bit like a motorcycle taking off. Um, so that's the pickerel frog. We don't have that many, they're uncommon in our watershed, so you'd be pretty lucky if you did hear or saw the pickerel frog. 
one frog that you'll hear calling typically in April and May is the American toad, Anaraxis americanus. So the American toad is one of two toad species that we do have in Ontario. And it is found throughout our watershed because American toads are habitat generalists. They're not too picky where they live. You can identify them, um, not really by their color, because they can be olive colored, they can be more brown, more red, but they always have a light line down the middle of their back. And they have all of these different kind of spots that have one to two raised bumps in that spot. If you do go out and you want to listen for them, you're going to listen for a high-pitched trill that will sound like this. So again, it's just that high-pitched trill. It's about 20 to 30 seconds. And you're most likely to hear them or see them after rain and in the evenings. And they are quite common throughout gardens and other urban areas. So you can definitely look for those outside around where you live. What frog do you think this is? Is it a leopard frog, pickerel frog, or American toad? If you said leopard frog, you're right. Whose call is this? The leopard frog, pickerel frog, or American toad? That was also a leopard frog with its throaty ass. One of my favorite frogs that live here in the watershed that is common but very hard to see because they are so good at camouflaging is the gray tree frog, or Hyla versicolor. So this is a small frog, much like the spring peeper. It's only about three to five centimeters. And they can be anywhere from like a light green to gray color. And they are able to change their color, not necessarily for camouflage, but normally more in response to temperature. So it can be any combination of gray and green and they look very kind of bumpy and splotchy. Um, they are found in woodlands and marshes, also especially where there's lots of willows and dogwoods where they can climb up those trees. So they are a true tree frogs and do have those suction cups on the tip of their fingers. And while they're really hard to spot because they are so good at camouflaging, you can listen for them. They have a short trill that actually sounds pretty similar to a raccoon. So again, that's just a short trill not to be confused with the American toad that had the much longer trill. The largest frog that we have in our watershed and in Ontario is the bullfrog, Lithobates cancibiana, 10 to 15 centimeters, which is quite huge. They are a green or olive or kind of brown color. Um, and then the Kind of giveaway characteristic that you really want to look for is that they have these large, basically, eardrums. So that is their typhanthum, which are those circles at the side of their head. And they do have a fold of skin going from their eye around that typhanthum down to their shoulder. They are not very common in our watershed. They're pretty rare just because they do like 
a deeper body of water, and Cooth Paradise Marsh, for example, is pretty shallow. That's what's making it a marsh. They will begin calling through May, and really any nights where there's a lot of humidity, especially in June, is when they're kind of at their peak. And they are calling about rum. They can say jug of rum, more rum, more rum, any kind of variation of that. And it sounds like this. Okay, now I want you guys to do a bullfrog call. So you can either say jug of rum, jug of rum, or you can say more rum, more rum. Let's hear you guys do that. The green frog, Lithobates clematis. This is a medium to large frog, anywhere from about six to nine centimeters. Despite being called a green frog and most often being green, they can still be more of a brown, bronze, copper, blue color, all sorts of different shades. They do have prominent dorsal lateral folds. They have these two kind of folds on the edge of their body going down their back. And they typically do still have a bright green spot no matter their color on their upper lip. And they have black bands going across their back legs. So that's where you're really looking for the distinction from the bullfrog when they're quite large. They are found in a wide range of habitats and are pretty common throughout our watershed. They have a call um, that you'll hear in June or July, so they're much more of a summer frog that you can listen for now. Uh, they have a call that is very much like a twang of a banjo. So it sounds like this. So it's kind of a glunky sound, like a bango being plucked, or like if you have a rubber band and you're, you're plucking at it. And if you're looking for the males, they will have a bright yellow chin. And they often are a little more territorial, so they may be wrestling someone, or at least another frog. What frog is this? Is it the gray tree frog? the American bullfrog, or the green frog. It's a gray tree frog. Whose call is this? <coughs> the gray tree frog, the bullfrog, or the green frog? That was the green frog. So having all these frogs here, we are quite lucky because frogs are important. They're an important part of nature, being part of the food web. So they're going to eat other animals, and other animals will eat them. Can you think of what a frog might eat? Maybe dragonfly larvae, flies, algae. So they help control those populations. Then they're providing food for other animals. What animals might eat a frog? Snakes, bald eagles. If we don't have frogs, we won't have those animals. They're also important as an indicator species. So as I mentioned earlier, frogs have a permeable skin. Things can go straight inside of them through their skin, which makes them really sensitive to different toxins and pollutants in our waterways. So by monitoring frogs, if we know they're not doing so well because of pollution or not enough oxygen in the water, or even maybe they're getting hit by cars, we know that the rest of the animals that share the marsh and different wetlands with these frogs are probably facing those same threats. So we use them to tell us how healthy the environment is. They're also really important to us. They help us understand 
not only the impacts we're having on the environment, but even ourselves. Frogs, studying frogs, led us to understand how our nerve, nervous system works. We studied the mucus, that sticky mucus. It has a peptide called magnum in it that we use in painkillers and antibacterial methods that we use in the hospital. We've even managed to breed a frog to be clear so that we can see right inside all the organs, like its heart and stomach, to try and understand how cancer impacts those organs and how other chemicals might impact the organ, where we can see it happening in real time, where they're like a little window into research. Why do you love frogs? big threats our frogs face is habitat pollution. So having things like garbage ending up in our waterways that frogs mistake for food or get trapped in. So it's really important that we make sure that we recycle, compost, and put our waste where it should belong. So we want to challenge you to go out and pick up garbage. However, how old you are, that's how many pieces we want you to go out and pick up with an adult helping. One threat that frogs also face is habitat loss. So not having a place to live, a home. So we want to help them have a home by protecting natural spaces where they live, like marshes and even forests. And you can help create habitat for frogs, including toads, by planting things like trees, which will also help clean the water where they live. It filters through the roots. Or even planting some nice native flowers like home flower. So we encourage you to go out and explore and see some of that biodiversity that we have. Take a look for all those wonderful frogs we have. And we really want you to evaluate what you're doing and how you can help frogs.